I read the obesity code. It made so much sense to me. But sustaining OMAD is a challenge for me, not because of hunger, but because of emotional attachment. Well, of course, but what is attachment? You can spend all the time you want watching my videos, reading books, uh, watching documentaries where people lost a lot of weight. And that's all that it's going to be is motivational videos and information that speaks to what you're trying to convince yourself of. But ultimately, when you get done with all of that, you're going to fall back down to earth and you're going to be faced with the same you. You're going to be faced with the same fact that reality comes crashing down. And all of that contrivance, it can be knowledge, it can be motivation, it can be music, it's going to come right back down to you. And when that happens, it's like a breaking of the spell. It's like a, uh, a wearing off of a charm. But that's the real nature of your problem. That's the reason you need motivation in the first place, is because you've replaced one addiction with another. You've replaced one drug with another. Whereas you were living on the endorphins of food, now you're living on motivational material. Like going to a, a get-rich-quick seminar where they pump you up and they say, you're just being negative, you've got to learn to be positive. And you say, that's right, I've got to learn to be positive. You're playing the same game with yourself that you've always played. But this is what was referred to in Buddhism as the wheel of suffering. You see, picture a table and a big, big round table. And across this table is everything a human being ever wanted to do. On one side of the table is an alcoholic who knows he needs to change. So he's getting, he's going to 12-step programs and he's, he's preparing to, to change. On the other side of that is someone who fell off the program and says, who cares? Don't care anymore. Been there, done that. On Right next to him is a drug addict with the same dilemma. Sitting on one side of the table is the druggie who's getting ready to clean himself up because he hates himself and he says, God, this is terrible. On the other side is the person who has yielded to that inner voice, that annoying cricket on his shoulder that says, you know you were going to fall anyway. Right next to him is a passionate athlete who says, I've got to cut my teeth and show my worth because I'm in the best shape of my life and I'm going to absolutely destroy this space. I'm going to be the fastest runner. I'm going to be the best tennis player. I'm going to train seven hours a day. I'm going to get up at the crack of dawn and I'm going to do all of that. Across from him is the person who's been there and who's done that and who's coaching. And he's got his ailments. He's got his career injuries and... He's decided to retire. Maybe he takes a job for a little bit of money as a uh, commentator on a sports channel. Are you seeing where I'm going here? One person is binging on the other side of that table. Directly across from him is the, the person uh, who has already binged and says, wow, this is Golden Corral. You know, this is, all the food here is so salty. Uh, now I have to go home and deal with the fact that I binged. And I'm going to feel guilty all day. So the one person wants to clean up his life and change his life. The other person is looking back at the old whippersnapper with all of that motivation and saying, you know what, this kind of sucks. Uh, it wasn't what I thought it, it is. Someone right now on this fictitious table we're talking about is sitting, uh, is sitting having bought that Amazon product and said, you know what, I can't wait till that product gets here. Yay, the product gets here. And on the other side of the table is that guy who says, yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, I liked it. it. It's not as awesome anymore as it once was. So what are you left with? You're left with that horribly unsatisfying feeling of why does it have to be this way? Why does it have to be the fact that one, there's a foolish young man and a wise old man on the other side of the table? Why is there a guy who's about to rob a liquor store on the one side of the table and the guy who's already robbed the liquor store and been busted and done time for it? And he's saying, oh, I'm reformed now. I spent 13 years in prison. I now know that I was foolish to ever attempt to do something so callous and heinous. This is what Buddha referred to as sansara, the wheel of suffering. The fact that we get in this stage, this pattern, which manifests as what 
I call an infinite regress. The infinite regress is any pattern or cycle you've ever created. Why does it have to be that way? You can mourn about it all day long and it will be no different than survivor's guilt. Why did my best friend have to die instead of me? We were both in that car. And it's one of those things where you're facing basically the God, basically the great divine. You're saying, why does it have to be this way? Completely, that will get you nowhere. So what do you do? What you're not seeing past, and the nature of an attachment is not the fact that it's a relationship between brain chemicals, but between the fact that it's not pretty or lovely or attractive. The wheel always creates itself from everything that is ever out there. And it's not pretty. It's like two cats mating. It's, it's like a, a, a young man chasing a woman. It has beauty in the time if you, it, if you see it as an art form. But then when you look at it later on, you say, okay, I've been there, done that. It, it's no longer. So it's the same wheel. But that wheel, what you're mad about with an attachment, with every attachment you've ever had, is, is it's the fact that you can't see anything to relate it to. So you look at the whole situation and you say, this is truly terrible. This is truly awful. Why does it have to be like that? So what you have to do is find a way to say, oh, I've seen this before. You're faced with any dilemma. You say, oh, I've seen that before. Imagine uh, a kid comes over to your house and sees a big monster in the corner. And you look over, oh, that's just, uh, yeah, that's just the Jabberwocky in the corner over there. You know, I've seen him before. That's the, 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 the difference between a kid and an adult. Kids see monsters under their bed. The adults seen them years. They realize they're, they're pretty harmless. It's just that way. So the adult has quit fighting. And the kid is not. Because that they're sitting on opposite sides of the table. So the result is your mind goes back to what you spent all these years creating. Which is what an attachment really is. That's what an attachment really is. <laughs> it, it's the fact that you spent all of these years creating something. And you're mad at the fact that it is what it is. You call that an attachment, in other words. And what you're mad at is you're not able to see past it. So what do you do? You say, every time you're tempted, every time you face something awful or ugly, you say, we've seen this before. You already know what happens intellectually when you're about to clean up your life and anticipate falling off and end up falling off and then coming back around. So what's the answer? The answer is to say, oh, I've seen it before. It's not that big a deal. To not be surprised by it. Right then, when you're looking at it from that perspective, you already understand. That's, that's contentment. That's happiness. That's knowledge. You understand that it's not going to make you happy. Food will not make you happy. Drugs, everything, everything ad infinitum will not make you happy. But your knowledge of that is itself not very happy. So what do you do? you tell your brain, you say, this is contentment right now. So when you're in the midst of a craving, you say, this is contentment. This is knowledge right now. This is knowledge. The fact that you're thinking of, of going and blowing it all and going to get donuts. <laughs> Somebody uh, emailed me this morning and says, Joe, help, I'm going to get donuts. <laughs> I can't help you, man. Because if you need my help, the day will come again when I'm not there. See, you're nowhere. So what you do is you look at it and you get over the morning. You go through the morning stage. Why does it have to be this way? And you say, oh, I understand this. I see this. I got it. Oh, yeah, it's just the monster in the corner over there. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's a harmless monster. He's an ugly monster, but, you know, he's not going to hurt you. He can't hurt you. He's powerless. That's, a, that's the nature of every craving you've ever had. But that's understanding the wheel of suffering. So what do you do with a winning time you face a wheel, an infinite regress? You just walk away from it and you say, I'm not playing that game. You take no action. You just say, I've seen this before. And you walk away from it. So when you're feeling like you want to, to binge or do something crazy, you did that all this time. There's no point in mourning all the decisions you did make. Instead, you say, oh, I've seen this before. It'll be okay. Take no action. Don't swear yourself up and down. Don't repeat mottos. Don't repeat creeds. Don't do anything that you uh, think you should instinctively do. Because you understand the nature of an attachment. You created it. You did it. You made it. You ate 30 years of, of eating when you were hungry, 30 years of eating and getting full, not caring. 
is it really that much to say four, to, you know, two to three months of your life is, is going to be reformation and it's going to be brutal? It isn't on the logic of it, but if it is and, you, and you're not ex allowing yourself to accept that, it's a cosmetic thing because you want it to be beautiful. So the cycle is to just understand the wheel of suffering. And when you understand wisdom, you understand that the game is not a game to play. So food is not bad. You're not going to villainize food. You're not going to get on that motivational upswing where you say, you know what, damn it, uh, it's time to hate sugar. It's time to say that sugar is the problem. No, that's part of the, the that's the first of the wheel of suffering. Uh, I need to change my ways. That's the first of the wheel of suffering. And the last is, oh, screw this. I'm done thinking about it. I'm going to go out and order what I want. That's also the wheel of suffering. And every part of that in between. So to get off the wheel, you say, I'm not playing this game. I understand it's a craving. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, you know I'll, I'm good. So what you do is you write it out. And you realize that the same thing about a craving is the same thing with anything else in life. It's the same as a star, a, a cloud. It's all going to pass. Try watching the clouds. Ultimately, you look back in a few minutes and it's gone. The same way with a craving. So you acknowledge it. You say, yeah, that's a monster over there. That's the... Uh, the Jabberwocky in the corner. I see it from time to time. He comes around from time to time, but he's harmless. But you don't react. You don't react. You don't say, I've got to not do this. You just, you acknowledge it and you go on. And when you do that, you get off of sansara, the wheel of suffering. Unfortunately, the show is not a pleasant one because everybody around you is still on the wheel. Everybody around you is still going to go through some... Uh, Raw till four, um, thigh blaster, uh, mega cleanse, uh, something else, because they're still on that wheel. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry that in some of your cases, this isn't what you thought it would be. It's not about motivation. It's not about effort. It's not about willpower. It's about recognizing that every single thing you ever aimed for is just a part of the cycle. It's not about getting excited, getting motivated, reading books, even though those can help. They're really deceitful. Every time you learn something, you have to integrate that with your knowledge. And if you happen to be in a position when you read a book, you, you receive something that, that blesses you from what you already knew, then it's a good learn because you were in a position to learn that. But if you're not, then it's just you saying, oh, I need to learn all this information. And you go and try and apply it and you realize it doesn't apply to you. That book was written for someone else. And you spent all that time doing that. The same way you spent all of that time years years eating uh, eating when you were hungry, eating when you were bored, eating when you wanted to take back the power because you were depressed about something that you couldn't control anyway. You did this. <laughs> you jumped on the wheel of suffering and you thought it was a good idea. You can, ex you can explain that as a kid because you don't know any better. You don't know anything until well after your 20s. You start to, you think you got things nailed down and figured out. And then you realize, no, I was, it would, there was never a reason to get on it anyway. But bygones are bygones because you can't go back. You can't revisit that. So it's not pleasant. It's not pretty. It's not motivational. It isn't what you think. It's a monster. And it's the thing you were afraid of as a kid. But it has to be there because there's something on the other side of it. There's something beautiful on the other side of it. Well, the whole thing is beautiful. The whole thing is beautiful. But it's not. It's something you want to sit back and look. You don't want to be in any beautiful picture in your living room. You want to look at them from afar. Because it's, a, it's only a picture. It's not reality. Reality is only what you can experience. Hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, feeling. Those are the things that are real. Everything else is just a picture. Which brings to mind an experience. So get off the wheel of suffering. There's nothing there for you, but you already knew that, right? 